The Barber of Seville is one of the greatest comedy operas of all time. Rossini's masterpiece has become one of the best-loved operas in the repertoire and is performed in opera houses all over the world. Here at Glyndebourne, we staged a new production of Barber for the 200th anniversary of its 1816 premiere in Rome. My name is Danielle Denise, and I'm a soprano. I'm performing the role of the opera's heroine, Rosina. So how do you turn a musical score into a fully-fledged operatic performance? Well, I'm going to take you behind the scenes to give you a warts and all look at the process of building an opera from scratch. You'll see ups and downs and highs and lows as I prepare my very first Rossini opera and my very first Rosina. If you do that, you're, you're sounding like you want to slow down. We'll explore Rossini's musical genius with the conductor. It's magic. Yeah, it's this, magic. Is, this is the genius of Rossini. For me, mastering Rossini's music is only the beginning. I'll show you how I create the role dramatically to really bring Rosina to life. Finding the right look is essential. The hair and makeup. You know, the you fun. get the, um, the fun and the like, grrr. My costume. Should we put it on? I think we should. You might have to look away now. And we'll look at how to bring out Barbara's comedy with our director. High, high stakes of the comedy are that they are pushing their luck as far as they can push it. Along the way, we'll discover how an opera is put together as a whole. It's meshing the, the artistic intent with some brutally practical things. So let's have a look and see how it all happens. <laughs> we did it! Each summer, Glyndebourne stages an opera season here in the Sussex countryside. If I do my job properly when I appear here, my performance will be effortless. But the preparation isn't. Barber is nearly three hours long, and I need to be physically fit. I actually can't afford not to work out for this role because part of singing all of this requires a level of abdominal support uh, that I need to keep in shape for. I have a 10-month-old baby, and I injured my abdominal cavity when I was pregnant. I, uh, I really must dedicate time to staying on this treadmill and uh, um, studying, studying all my cadenzas. Ideally, I would do a fast run, but last year I injured my ankles while rehearsing. I find that I, I will do whatever it takes to be the show. In this film, I'll show you the challenges and satisfactions of creating a character on stage. My debut here at Glyndebourne was in 2005 as Cleopatra in Handel's opera Giulio Cesare. And I first met Gus Christie, who was, though I didn't know it then, my future husband. Now we have a baby boy called Bacchus. Gus is Glyndebourne's executive chairman, and Glyndebourne has always been a family concern. My grandfather, John Christie, uh, married my grandmother, Audrey Mildmay, in the 1930s and built the opera house uh, in the back garden for her. She was an opera singer. She opened uh, the first season in The Marriage of Figaro singing Susanna, a role which Danny has sung many times. Not here. Not here. Um, but, uh, and that's where, how it all started, back in the, in the early 30s. And then my dad, George Christie, knocked down his father's theatre in the early 90s and rebuilt the current theatre, which seats 1,250. And it's now a, very much a, a, an international opera house. Well, it always was, but it's, e it's, it's even more so. 
So really, we're continuing a Christie family tradition. It's quite spooky. I mean, yeah, and the fact that we actually got married on the day that my grandmother was born, we on the 19th know. of December, yeah. they got married on the day that our son Bacchus was born. So there's a lot of a strange, strange the, de the destiny of the dates is, is <laughs> it is quite spooky. When Glyndebourne Festival offered me the part of Rosina, I jumped at the chance. I had been singing her main aria since I was 12 years old and always dreamed of performing the whole role. My career has taken me to the other great opera houses abroad, but it's always special singing at home. There is quite a rigorous uh, casting process here, and we all sit together, all more or less uh, voice and, and opera ac experts, knowing the repertoire, um, looking at what's the right voice and what's the right type for a certain role. Each time I take on a new role, it's like I'm jumping off a diving board into the deep end. So preparing for Rosina, I feel a little bit like this lovely sculpture here in the grounds of Glyndebourne. And it's a particular challenge to take on such a beloved role in such an immortal opera. Rossini's piece is based on the first of three plays by the 18th century French playwright Pierre Beaumarchais. They feature the adventures of a Mr. Fixit, a barber called Figaro. Mozart adapted the second play into his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, featuring Count and Countess Almaviva. Ours is a kind of prequel, showing how that couple first met. You, you can't not be in a good mood when you hear the Barber of Seville. <laughs> sort of like when uh, you're working and it's, it's wafting through the halls, everybody's in a good mood at Glyndebourne. <laughs> This is where the magic happens. The auditorium here is a very intimate space, perfect for Rossini. This is the beauty of, of this music. So it's always full of energy, electricity. So uh, I'm Italian. I have to eat spaghetti al dente, you know, when uh, the, inside the, 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 spa the spaghetto is uh, still a little bit uh, hard and you feel this. So Rossini is exactly uh, like this. My character, Rosina, is a wealthy young woman in 18th century Spain. Now, she is the ward of Dr. Bartolo, an elderly man who plans to marry her. Now this is not an idea that Rosina likes. Rossini's story begins in the early hours of the morning on a street in Seville. Count Almaviva, a Spanish nobleman, comes to serenade Rosina. He had seen Rosina from afar and fallen in love. This is the first of numerous attempts to woo her. Rossini is really establishing that this is very much a comedy, but it's a comedy that involves very real, deep emotions, love and the quest for love. Rossini's punchline in the opening is that after all of this romantic effort, Rosina does not even appear on the balcony during the serenade. Almaviva overhears Figaro, the barber of Seville, boasting of his troubleshooting talents. <laughs> the Count hires Figaro, and they plot ways to bypass Dr. Bartolo. <laughs> Rosina does emerge, eventually. She has a love note, and the stage is set for the comedy to come. 
And speaking of stage and set, they're a vital part of an operatic production. Something that is made of wood and canvas and the odd bit of steel can easily cost the same as, as a comfortable semi-detached house somewhere. There's a hundred people in the workshop working on it. Then there's all of the staff who work on the, on the production here as well. Singers aren't around when our show sets are installed. So I came along to see the interior of Bartolo's house being put together. Tom, so what's going on here this morning on the stage in the background? Well, this is, this is terrifying day number one because this is the first time since rehearsal started that the show is coming to the stage. So um, we're madly fitting up now. The floor's going down, the walls will go in, and we'll be ready for you to rehearse this afternoon. <laughs> um, that's the, yeah, that's the sound of timber creaking. Ours is just one of six production sets, and it's a different opera every night. It's a Meccano kit because it's got to come apart, you know, right. twice in 24 hours. It's meshing the, the artistic intent with some brutally practical things. Our set was designed by Joanna Parker, working closely with director Annabel Arden. We decided that we wouldn't worry too much about naturalism, that it's, there's an element of fantasy in it. And so I suppose the overall tone of it is theatrical and it is highly colourful. Every set needs to serve the drama and drive the story. Ours is circular, which I love because it suggests Rosina has nowhere to hide. So in a sense, she's a prisoner. Do you have the, a, a wall that is permeated by light in these openings? There isn't an outside. But now the mysterious serenader offers a chance of freedom and love. The Count has told Rosina that he's a poor student called Lindoro. He wants her to love him, not his money. Ah, Rosina is smitten, and this leads to her first aria, one of the greatest in the repertoire, Una Voce Poco Fa. Here, Rosina shares her inner thoughts and emotions directly with the audience. Arias are like Shakespearean soliloquies set to music. And traditionally, where we singers display our vocal range and technique. Rosina can be a challenge for a soprano like me. Rossini wrote this part for a mezzo-soprano, a lower voice. And so my focus with preparing this aria is to ensure that I can sing with a beautiful, healthy sound some of these middle and low notes, but not to put too much weight or chest voice into the sound because it will affect my ability to negotiate the very top parts of my register of my voice. We build with Danny each single breath. In this way, Danny knows when I will give my upbeat, that in the language of the conductors, the upbeat is the breath of the singers. And I know exactly when Danny is going to breathe. Rossini's music is famous for its coloratura, elaborate melodies with endless runs, trills, and vocal leaps. Rossini's genius was that he composed coloratura not just to dazzle the audience with vocal displays, he used it dramatically as well, here helping express Rosina's determination to escape. But it's not easy to sing. You have 
difficult coloratura, and then you have absolutely infernal coloratura. There is an example even in the first three pages where she says, Dolce amorosa. This is nine notes. It's always sung like this. There is a grace note in here as well. So that means Rossini actually wanted to hear 10 notes. Da -da 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 Enrique, our maestro, has said to me, don't do it. However, I did say to him, yeah, but wouldn't it be cool if we could do it? And we did. We trust each other. Dani knows that I'm watching her. I'm watching, preparing the breath. I will never be too early. I will never be too late. But I know that even if Dan is watching the public, there is this corner of the eye watching the upper bit of my white baton. And uh, this is something unique and wonderful. Traditionally, arias in Italian operas end with cadenzas, improvised displays of vocal fireworks where we can show off. I have this idea to make a cadenza that sort of pays homage to the cadenzas of old. And my final La Vincero, I will win him. I want to sort of take off. I want to sprout wings and fly and suddenly come out of it at a certain point. La Vincero. I was hearing all sorts of new colors and a seamless connection to the higher voice, which I knew very well, um, in a way that I think really opens up a lot of possibilities for her. During the run, I came to Rome to talk with another diva about her experience of portraying Rosina. It's a challenge achieving a believable balance between Rosina's sweetness and determination. She wants to be strong, but is still so young and naive. I wondered how Alberta Valentini, the Italian soprano who performed Rosina at Glyndebourne in 1961, had handled her. Non ho avuto esperienza, però lei è molto arguta perché mm. quando fa la scena, eh, signorina, che cercate? Mm. Vado, vado, non gridate. Non gridate, vado, vado, non gridate. Cioè, lei sa. Quello mm. che deve fare. Certo, ha un piano. Ha un piano, piano della difesa, sì, diciamo, sì. della difesa del suo amore. E lei ha fatto, quando ha cantato una voce, ha fatto Mi fa guida Roma. Perché quella era molto di tradizione in quell'epoca, sì, sì, è vero? Sì, sì, e lei ha fatto questo? Sì, sì. Ah, wow. Sì. Io trovo che è carino perché conclude un discorso. Eh, mi fa guidare. Ma non è vero, mi fa guidarmi. Ma... Ma... Ma se mi tocca dove il mio debole sarà una vibra. Some think that this calculating viper is not a believable young woman. Rossini's first biographer Stendhal didn't. But I wonder if Rosina's just talking big, like teenage girls do, about things she hasn't really experienced yet. Non ha l'occasione, no, mm. non l'ha avuta perché c'è anche il Bartolo che sta sempre lì. Mm. And here we are talking about having very similar, similar processed feelings about this Rosina who, you know, says that she can be a viper, but isn't necessarily such a viper. But she would defend herself if she had to, and this is what's so marvelous about her. Lei ha molto... Sapore, lei ha molto, sì. ha, ha molto temperamento. Non ci dimentichiamo che è spagnola, eh? <laughs> Let's not forget she's Spanish. It was here in Rome that Giacchino Rossini composed Barbiere between late 1815 and early 1816. The maestro was just 23 and already a superstar across Europe. Some critics sniffed that he was a noisemonger. 
but audiences loved his work. We're here in the center of Rome, and just above me you can see a plaque that reads, Living in this house, Gioacchino Rossini found eternally new harmonies in the Barber of Seville. It's beautifully poetic and very Italian. Rossini had a furious working pace. Over his composing career, he wrote an average of two operas a year. Some years, he penned four. This may be why the librettist Cesare Sterbini is reported to have been reluctant to sign up. Legend has it that Rossini wrote his entire masterpiece in just three weeks. Some say the maestro and Sterbini worked together here, sleeping on a sofa when they could no longer stay awake, and eating only when necessary. But it was worth it. Beethoven told Rossini in 1822, Barbiere will be played as long as Italian opera exists. Before I start singing a role, I always immerse myself in the text. So, niente, niente, signore. Sono le parole dell'aria dell'inutile precauzione. I'm very curious about the rest between son le parole dell'aria dell'inutile precauzione. The fact that there's a rest there tells me that maybe she's fishing her way through the phrase. Maybe she thought, oh, these are just the words to the song, um, if, from the useless precaution. Cos'è quella carta? Niente, niente, signore. Sono le parole dell'aria del precauzione. So she's coming up with it on the spot. And so this is how one builds an interpretation. So I was very excited that our conductor, Enrique Mazzola, planned to perform Barber as Rossini intended. Especially for what's known in Italian as the recitativo, where dialogue is sung in a conversational style. Ma dite, signor Figaro, voi poco fa, sotto le mie finestre. Rossini wanted his recitativo to follow the rhythms of natural speech. But over the centuries, various traditions have become accepted that change the overall delivery. Every famous singer of the past put something new. Sometimes it's just the singer, singer's ego. I can do a very high and nice... Uh, beautiful note, like a high uh, C. Our Figaro, the German baritone Bjorn Berger and I, have come in to lightly rehearse and review the maestro's back-to-basics approach. We'll look at the famous scene where Figaro intrigues Rosina with information about her suitor. In confidenza, a un gran difetto addosso. Un gran difetto! Ah, grande! È innamorato morto. Sì, davvero. Quel giovane, vedete, mi interessa moltissimo. Erbacco. Non ci credete? Oh, sì. Fai sang. Sì, davvero. Quel giovane, vedete, mi interessa moltissimo. Yeah, I, 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 this would be sung. This yeah, would be too sung yeah, for a rest. Yeah, so, yeah. sounds of the voice is less important than where the word sits. And uh, so the difference of that is like, si, davvero, quel giovane vedete, mi interessa moltissimo. So we, are, we reach the rhythm of the, yeah. of the, of the spoken. E la sua bella dite, abita lontano. Oh, no, cioè, qui, due passi. Ma, è bella. Oh, bella sai. Eccovi il suo ritratto in due parole. Well, I, I like very much this moment when you say, ma è bella. I, I still struggle with it, I have to say. I go, ma, ma è bella. But when I'm singing it, I can't always get, I can't get the exact same... Uh, it really but annoys you have, me. You have, you, have to go, you have to go in normal life. Ma è bella. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go in normal life. E si si rosi e ne andò. Rosina. Oh, it's, 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 it's yeah, magic. It's magic. This sparkling scene ends with a well-known duet. Well, 
two arias sung at the same time, really. And Rossini's rules for arias are different from the recitativo. And then the duet starts. And then the fear begins. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this bit. It's my literally most feared phrase. Well, Thank the, you, the, BBC, the, for filming so this, this bit. Is... <laughs> Bravissimo, Bjorn. So, a very good example of the difference between recitativo and the sung part mm -hmm. with the orchestra. Yes. In this moment, di lindoro il bagogetto. The it's rhythm goes clear. exactly with yep. the rhythm and doesn't go in the rhythm of the words. And when the orchestra is playing, may you play the bassi, the left hand of the orchestra. You see how it fits? How it fits. So the, exactly this is the tempo. But, but, so. Enrique wants the arias to end with a bang, just as Rossini liked. You know what I have always in mind? You know these American movies with a, with a car uh, going out from a building? and crashing in a big uh, window, uh, glass window, on <laughs> yes, the, and there's yeah. this big crash. So I think the final of this aria should be like this. You are crashed. So let's go again. <laughs> This is the genius of Rossini. Yeah. Before I sing a performance, I need to warm up my voice. Be advised, this is not the most glamorous part of my job. I'm taking the approach that in order to like truly lift the lid on a process, you need the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, this is the ugly. When you're working with an instrument that is variable, like a human voice, which can be like me today, a little bit gunky, it means that you do have to use your training to assess what you might need more of in terms of the exercises. It's a, exactly like being a sports athlete. If you're feeling a little bit tight in your hamstrings, you'll do more hamstring stretches. So we can do the same thing with our voices. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do these straw exercises, which are going to essentially do like this to my vocal cords. They're just going to stretch and tone them and it'll start to clean off the gunk. I put headphones on so I don't have to listen to myself. Um, it's so easy to judge yourself. So in my case, I just put my little uh, iPod or phone on to shuffle. Okay, I got a bit of sting. I do this other very ugly exercise. It is putting a pen inside your mouth and singing without letting the pen drop out. I'll do this. Now, putting the pen in my mouth means my jaw is immobilized from getting in the way. So that is why it's an ugly thing to do, but it has a big payoff if you coordinate your air as a result. So Renata Tibaldi was apparently like absolutely effortless when she sang. Um, I suppose that's the benchmark there, but you know, <laughs> we'll try. Opera is not just about music. Glyndebourne was one of the first venues to emphasize the importance of acting. 
Opera is about telling stories. In order to bring the story across, we need very good actors. Um, and Danny being one, one perfect example. When I was a little girl, just starting out, my mother taught me that there is a crucial distinction between singing and performing. It's not just my lines that matter, but how Rosina interacts with and responds to the various men in her life. So I've been working on different body language and movement to reflect these very different relationships. I think Rosina loves Figaro as well as the Count, just in a different way. She trusts Figaro and can be very playful with him. So when Bjorn and I are on stage together, we interact very freely with one another. And of course, the way Rosina relates to Don Bartolo, whom she despises, is rather different. Bartolo is Rosina's legal guardian, so she has to be respectful. But I make my body language rigid and tense. I pull up my ribcage a little higher. My legs are stiff with frustration. It's my way of showing that while Rosina may be doing her dovere, her duty, she really doesn't like it. There's something very uh, feline about Danny. Danny has an enormous facility uh, to be able to sing and move and uh, play at all at once. And that it makes her very exciting and enormous fun to play with. Hopefully all these tiny details will make my Rosina very believable as a complex young lady and a well-rounded character. Rosina's incredibly attracted to Count Almaviva, but he's a stranger, really. So when he embarks on Figaro's next plan and enters the house disguised as a drunk soldier, Rosina's excited, but also nervous. I can express this physically, tilting my chin slightly forward in an amorous way, but pulling my body back a little to suggest uncertainty. If you can't engage your body from head to toe in that same way for a character, it can be a very, very beautifully sung performance and something is missing. It's a little bit like those wind-up ballet doll and the little ballerinas, like, they're turning and it's, it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's crystalline, it's perfect, but it's lifeless. And for me, if you can marry to a wonderful vocal performance, a stunning physical performance, then you have theatrical magic. The details of our characters' appearance are a crucial part of expressing their complexities. Perfecting Rosina's hair and makeup has been a key part of the process for me. So here we are. I'm with Sarah Piper, our head of makeup, and Sheila Slaymaker, our head of wigs and hair. Uh, and we're starting to get ready to create Rosina. The process has been entirely collaborative. Annabelle has directed me to really come with a very fresh innocence at the beginning. And so then that will really affect our decision making yeah. together. Well, what we what what colors we're going to go for. It's got a nice luminosity to it, that base, isn't it? It has got a the, nice um, luminous, yeah, yeah, yeah it's nice. The general feeling of Rosina, she's young and effervescent and ebullient and alive, and she's very present, and her eyes, you know, speak volumes, and that's what we wanted from Rosina, and I'm really lucky I've got people who can go, okay, we'll get her eyes to pop like that. I think any girl who wears lipstick would be able to say that even for going out to a party, you would know when you hit the jackpot with your lipstick color. And the same happens with characters here. And when I've got this color on, I'm like, oh, I'm looking out the window, I'm hopeful, I'm happy. It's great, I love it. Another big decision was which wig I should wear. Now, this may sound frivolous, but it has a huge impact on how Rosina fits in with the overall concept of the opera. You know, this also takes place in Spain, and so we needed this kind of yeah. caliente, we needed this sort of dark, 
smoldering, young but smoldering. It's a very tough balance. I mean, I feel like we've it achieved is. that. We were trying to also fulfill Joanna's desires with your character and Annabelle's input to have something just a bit different and now. Annabelle decided against our other wig option. It was wonderful, but maybe a little bit too much. Okay, here she comes. <laughs> God. Isn't that so amazing? It's so different. It's it? so different. This has youth and it has rebellion in it, which I think is an important quality of Rosina. And of course, I had like off the shoulders, so you know that's what it would have looked like. You know, you get the, the fun yeah, and fun. the like, grrr, you get all that. But I was really nervous that this like this quality of like just looking to the face, looking right into the soul, might not be there. But I think we've kept a bit of that grrr in Rosina's character. We had a lot of fun with that one. It's one of those things that was discarded. But it's still there, and I think both her and I are sort of, like, still <laughs> thinking about it. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe she'll go out in it one night. <laughs> we can go dancing. <laughs> the same amount of thought and care went into preparing our costumes. Joanna and Annabelle spent months perfecting them. We trawled the streets of London and for fabrics and we went into shops and then we'd be like, this, does this work with this? You know, f you know, swatch after swatch after swatch after swatch. Kleinborn is quite unusual because all of our costumes are made here on site. And you meet the cutters and I've got 15 fabrics working in these layers. This is one of my favorite parts of the production process. I was always the kid at school in the dress-up box. This is my act one costume. Di and I know this quite well now. We've been practicing getting into it. And it is an amazing piece of art, really, when you look closely at all of the applique. What it makes come alive for the character of Rosina is this flirtatious playfulness, her youth. Should we put it on? I think we should. You might have to look away now. It's essential that my costume allows me to move and breathe easily on the stage. We don't sing from the neck up. We sing with our diaphragm and our support in our abdominal cavities here. And uh, when you're wearing a corset, you basically have something to push against. Although Di, my <laughs> wonderful dresser, knows that there is two little hooks in the back of my costume, which I always ask her to release right around my upper rib cage, just to allow me yeah. to breathe. Two layers, so it's um, quite difficult when she's warming up at the same time to, to get her into it. It's in these fittings that my character becomes complete. There's a vulnerability to this costume that really appeals to my senses of who I think Rosina is. And I really wanted to capture this somehow. So the moment when I put this costume on, I thought, oh, now I have a thread from the inside of my soul to the outside of the skin of the character. I have the vulnerability that I'm looking for. You're hoping that she's felt what it's like. And she is somebody who does, she's very sensual in that sense. So. I think the memory of something she inhabits. Shoes, oh my God. So, I love shoes. Shoes for me are something I'm willing to suffer for. I'm now gonna put on the shoe for you that we chose in the end, which is actually a dance shoe. Let me see if I can balance my way into that die. They have that They've got, they've got that little bit of spitfire character in her that shows that Rosina, somebody who, like, who could break out into dance at any moment, she could be ready with a quick retort. That's, this is what I love about Rosina, so uh, we settled on these shoes. To fully realize all the nuances of our character's movements and appearance on stage, the lighting has to be perfect. So the lighting designer will have come in 
with an idea of how they, they want the production to look. Because we run our festival with performances practically every night of different operas, okay, we'll try to like over the rehearsal uh, that the singers are having on stage. We'll then try to schedule some sessions which are just dedicated to lighting so that the lighting designer is happy with, with the levels. When all of these elements work in harmony on stage, musically and dramatically, the results in Rossini are spectacular. Especially at the end of Act One, where the Count, in drunken soldier disguise, comes to blows with Bartolo and the police arrive. It will all lead to a wonderful scene of ensemble singing. And suddenly, the chorus, the principals, the, 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 all the soloists, they start to sing something crazy. Rossini was a master at composing ensembles, weaving together multiple voices to marvelous musical effect. To sing them is incredibly rewarding and totally terrifying. Often we're all singing different lines, but at the same time. This is a, a typical Rossinian solution. This, uh, also I would say very Italian, this uh, uh, way to show that we are crazy, that we don't understand, that we are confused, we are lost. Rossini's music builds and builds through multiple crescendos, each one reaching new levels of impossibly fast chaos and confusion. I think you have to embrace the fact that it, it is mad, and it, and it builds and builds and gets madder and madder. But it is an enormous challenge. It's like a tapestry or a Persian carpet or a, or a kaleidoscope. By the end, all of our characters are reduced to insanity, as the libretto says. It is a musical masterpiece, though, and really great fun to perform. Of course, Rossini loved to leave cliffhangers at the end of Act One. After all, you don't want people going home during the interval. My first night performance of Rosina was pretty nerve-wracking. And after the madness of the Act One finale, it's strange being in my dressing room alone. Especially as Glyndebourne traditionally has a long 90-minute interval for the audience to dine and picnic in. The challenge for me is to keep focused on my character and performance. <sighs> okay, so it's the middle of the opening of uh, Barbiere di Siviglia. And how am I feeling? Um, I'm feeling really good. I, I'm so really, really nervous actually, but I also was so excited to get here and fear is a very big part of singing I think but um, so is faith and that's what I'm focusing on today. Now I'm gonna shut up so that I can get ready for the second half. Our first show made me wonder about Rossini's own premiere. It happened in Rome, so while I was there, I visited the venue to get a flavor of that historic first night. So behind me is the Teatro Argentina, where the Barber of Seville had its first public performance on the 20th of February, 1816. I'm so excited. I've never been to Rossini's theater before. Let's go and have a look inside. Okay, 
Here we are. Wow. This is incredible. To think that Rossini was just right there. Playing, conducting. I, I, I'm, uh... It's hard to bring yourself back in history until you have a moment like this when you can just walk here, be here, breathe the air, spend time on the floorboards, I'm trying to imagine what it would feel like on a premiere to walk in Rosina for the first time and sing those first, those first few notes. I, I sort of can't resist. I think I'm going to try a little something. Una voce poco fa. Quite a good acoustic. I love it. Qui nel cuor mi risuono. Bellissimo. It's really so fabulous to sing in. So surely the premiere was a magnificent triumph, right? Rossini expert Daniele Carnini told me all about it. How did it go? Well, the premiere was not a success. Uh, it was a disaster, frankly. <laughs> uh, there was a um, clerk, someone who was against Rossini. Groups yeah. of people who are more or less, are they paid, right, to applaud mm. for one person or boo somebody else? Yes, probably they were paid, but we are not sure about that. And as Rossini told to his mother, uh, there was an, an enormous whispering throughout the premiere, so the music was barely uh, understood. That must have been quite distracting for both the singers and for Rossini. Yes, in this case it was really impossible, as Rossini said, uh, to understand uh, le, le note, no? Yes, the notes. Uh, yeah, exactly. There had been a previous opera adaptation of The Barber of Seville by Giovanni Paisiello. It's said that his supporters were not happy about Rossini's version. And so did anyone clap? No. No. No oh. applause. <laughs> no applause. <It> off. <laughs> Except in Rossini himself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At the end of first act, applauded his singers oh. to say, OK, it, it has been a... To give them courage. Yeah, it has been a difficult you first act, it. but... And the public, <laughs> boo! One of the most... Uh, the greatest disaster of Rossini's career. But Rossini maybe didn't attend the second performance. He called, uh, he, he called himself, himself off, I'm ill, so I'm staying, I'm staying home. Rossini was worrying too much. The rest of his run was a storming success. Rossini wrote to his mother that the audience cheered this work of mine with an enthusiasm for which I came out five, six times to receive applause of a totally new kind. And that made me cry with pleasure. I love that letter Rossini wrote to his mom. These immortal composers are made of flesh and blood, just like the rest of us. The maestro's emotional roller coaster during the premiere makes me feel closer to him. And so we move on to act two of Rossini's musical masterpiece. Poor Bartolo isn't rid of Rosina's suitor just yet. You have to give credit to Count Almaviva. He's pretty determined. He dons yet another disguise and in religious robes, charms his way inside by pretending to be a music teacher. The singing lesson scene that follows is perhaps the most famous and funniest scene in the opera. It's also one of the hardest to get right. Operatic comedy is very difficult to do, and it's much easier doing tragedy, in my opinion. The, the thing about comedy is it's about timing. You have to be so... Uh, at one with the music that you can play the comedy on top. <laughs> you need to be really free just to flick your eyes at your partner and keep it alive. We were still perfecting this scene even after opening night. Today we've arranged a session with our Bartolo 
Italian baritone Alessandra Corbelli, and American tenor Taylor Staten, who plays Alma Viva. Now, Taylor's objective is he wants to touch Danny, and she wants it too, but she doesn't want Bartolo to see. Oh. Okay, so that's the scene. The comedy here depends entirely on the dramatic tension. So we have to resist playing this scene solely for laughs. Part of the trap of this particular scene is that it can kind of descend into a comedic thing, whereas we need to keep the tension. You're right, Danny. It mustn't descend, in, descend into a cheap comedic thing. Yeah. But the high, high stakes of the comedy are that they are pushing their luck as far as they can push it. But I was thinking about actually faulty towers, and you know you're going to spend half an hour laughing your head off. But if you actually look at all the actors, they're not laughing at all. They're sweating. They're they're freaking out. They're trying to remain calm. They're you know they're trying to get through a situation. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, it's yes. just we finally exactly. are here, he's asleep. Yeah. And I think, well, in the end, the kiss happens because we forget all about yeah, it's him true, it's being true, there. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Wasn't I here? Yeah. Balancing the tension and the timing is key to judging when the lover should finally touch. When you're really on a stage, this works better because this, funnily enough, kills everything. It right. has some sort it of gets, finality about it. Yeah. yeah. Here we are, we did it. Yeah. It has to be real between yes. you. The emotions have to be real. To be real. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe that kiss. Rosina's Act Two costume reflects this change in her character. Act two for me is when Rosina comes into her own. She lets all of this sort of voluptuous, sensual energy out. And we know she's going to try to break free. But the colors of this breaking free are quite deep and quite rich, and they have purples and burgundies to them. And they have a bit of sort of blood in them. There's a bit of sort of sweat and blood and tears that come out of in this as well. Even the petticoat is black. Avanti, avanti. Alas, there are more obstacles for these lovers to overcome. Bartolo lies to Rosina, so she thinks Lindoro has betrayed her. Recently, Maestro Mazzola was told about another aria for Rosina that Rossini wrote for this part of the opera. Rossini composed it for a soprano voice three years after the premiere. I immediately thought, Danny, Glyndebourne, we have a, a soprano. It's like Rossini writing something new for Dani. I worked hard to perfect this piece with my voice teacher. What's that? Brenner, yeah. the, I got the B, that, uh -huh. as you said, head voice by B. <laughs> 
like if you were on that B, you should be able to be in the same space as the G. Composers so often added arias for favorite performers or ones who demanded a bigger role. Rossini added his for this lady, Josephine Fodor Menviel, but it's rarely performed. You know, often when you add an extra aria to an opera, uh, even one that's written by the composer, it, that's usually cut, you kind of think, oh, is this going to slow down the dramaturgy? Is, is people going to be checking their watches or whatever? Following the great Rossinian tradition, Maestro Mazzola and I wrote some vocal variations for the aria, rather late one evening. You know, it was all dark, there was only this light, the piano, the blank paper, a pencil, and two crazy people. No, it's better. That's better. Doing like this. So it was, uh, you know, it was funny at the moment. And when I think of this moment, I find it magical because, because this is Rossini. 200 years ago, the Rosina of the time and Rossini were doing exactly the same thing. Rosina reveals her vulnerability. She longs for Lindoro to be innocent. That's something that adds tremendous dimension to her character, but also tremendous ballast to the drama. And, and uh, prepares for the denouement, the happy denouement. After Rosina rejects him, Lindoro finally reveals that he's been Count Almaviva all along. The lovers are reconciled. So in this opera, I don't have to tragically die of a wasting disease or hurl myself off a tall tower. Everything turns out okay in the end. Rosina is happily married and true love wins the day. After all, it's the Barber of Seville. It's a comedy. I'm always happy when uh, we finish The Barber. And Rossini gives this message. Enjoy, enjoy the opera. Laugh with the person you're sitting uh, with. And go home with a, a, a lighter heart and a big smile. And this is very important. I would say today, 2016, we need this. As a performer, it's really touching to receive an ovation. It means the audience have been moved by what we've done. After months of hard work, this is the icing on the cake for everyone. Performing is exhausting, of course, but I'm also completely exhilarated at the end of a performance. I'm delighted to have brought this character to life. Viva Rosina and Viva Rossini. Mm -hmm.